You know, actually we closed the Zendo on March 15th, uh, just 11 days ago. So much has happened in those 11 days. We've been closed, but open in this new kind of way. Uh, and I have to say, it's been a great team effort. Um, there's so many people kind of stepped up and, and organized this uh, way of doing things uh, so that we can practice together every morning, uh, many evenings, and, uh, and really work together uh, to find our way in this difficult time. So if we were here, uh, if we were at the Zendo in face-to-face, person-to-person mode, tonight would be Fusatsu. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to honor uh, Fusatsu as best I can uh, to offer some thoughts that come up uh, for us during our monthly atonement ceremony. Fusatsu actually is a really ancient uh, full moon ceremony. It dates back, uh, it's said to date back to the time of um, Shakyamuni Buddha. Uh, and is always based on a kind of uh, reinvigorating of the moral and ethical teachings of our tradition. Uh, gives us a chance here uh, in, in our community uh, to, uh, to look at our actions and attitudes uh, towards other and the potentially harmful ways that we react. And by looking at that, we can kind of like auto-correct, uh, check ourselves and uh, come back uh, to our real intention of caring and serving others. So, of course, tonight we won't really uh, be bowing and chanting as we do in Fusatsu. But still, I, I really encourage you to uh, check in with yourself. How are you doing during this time? How are you following the Buddha way during this COVID-19 crisis? Because I think this is what we have as our support are the Buddhist teachings. How we can act in skillful ways, decent ways, to combat the fear and isolation that we find around us. The fear and isolation that threatens our own equilibrium wonderful to have a time to pause and reflect. And these old forms that we use, we use them uh, to help us to act and conduct ourselves in the modern world. So no matter how postmodern we may see ourselves in our relationship to faith, sometimes it's just good to come back to these basic truths, these basic ways of finding a balance in our life. You know, when we begin the Fusatsu ceremony, we, we begin with an atonement verse. All evil karma ever committed by me, sense of old, because of my beginningless greed, anger, and ignorance. Now I atone for it all. Right there is the most profound teaching. All evil karma, all the unskillful and harmful ways and inadequate actions that I've done and that I do, particularly now when fear and anxiety continue to arise. They consume me because of my own humanity, my own human way of being, which is to be 
subject to greed. I want anger. Keep it away. Don't do that. And my ignorance of not seeing that everyone around me in my apartment building, in my grocery store, on my street, are also part of me. We are one, which is the Buddhist teaching. I now atone for all the ways that I have not been aware of my role in the world. I atone. So, you know, I think of atone as making restitution. Uh, in English, it comes from at one. And in the uh, ancient uh, tradition, actually, the, the word was, uh, I regret. In the Chinese, Japanese form was, I repent, I, I come back, I, 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 I determine to not act in that kind of way again. So it's really a process in this fusatsu of acknowledging our actions, owning them, and letting them go. So you might want to consider any kind of any possible actions or thoughts, uh, conduct over the past few days, however trivial and momentary, Whatever you might have said, you might have thought, you know, how you might have acted, and offer an apology. Ultimately, it's an apology to ourselves, you know. I atone for this. Because these actions come from our very human reactivity. And by continuing to do this process of atoning, we learn, we teach ourselves how not to blame, how not to explode, how not to act selfishly. Most of us are, are alone. And that's hard. And others are not alone enough. <laughs> and that can be hard too. <laughs> so we are in a perfect place to practice that precept of recognizing that I am not separate from all that is, is the precept of non-harming. Recognizing that I am not separate from all that is, is the precept of, of not harming. I like to find a way to do that by calling the in, up the energies uh, that are summoned in the Fusatsu ceremony. Um, Shakyamuni Buddha, Manjusri, Avalokiteshvara. They are energetic archetypes. And you know, once we begin to appreciate them, they kind of like they are in us and we can call on them uh, when we need help. We can call on those energies to help us face difficult, difficult times, to face our fears and our desires. Shakyamuni, of course, that energy is the energy of interconnection, that we are all one fabric made of many threads. As he said, on his enlightenment, according to Zen Master Kazan, I and the great earth and all beings are simultaneously awakened. Not just Shakyamuni Buddha, but everyone throughout space and time. The quintessential statement of our interdependence. And that includes us, if we pay attention. 
This is the baseline that we keep coming back to now. Both the prisoner and the prison keeper, both the teenagers and skateboards and the old people alone in the park. The homeless and the business owners inside the bodega. All of us connected. And now all of us need compassion and recognition. You know, I think of my reactivity and what uh, occurred the other day in a grocery store. Um, I was picking apples and this couple with a lot of breath and a lot of air <laughs> talking to one another and came right up in my face. And, you know, I'm, I'm like very compliant. I've got my gloves and got my mask. Uh, and they seemed completely oblivious uh, to what I thought was really inappropriate behavior at this time. What do I do? Do I react harshly and, and say something? Do I come from my fear place? Or do I come sarcastically from my nasty place? Is it possible to take a breath, not their breath, but a breath, and make a quiet, civil comment? quietly move away. How could Shakyamuni's insight have helped me in that moment? We are not two. We're all in this together. This Japanese poet from the 10th century, uh, this woman, Shikubu, Shikibu, wrote, although I try to hold the single thought of Buddha's teaching in my heart, I cannot help but hear the many crickets voices calling as well. Although I try to hold the single thought of Buddha's teaching in my heart, I cannot help but hear the many crickets voices calling as well. Although we may try to recognize our interdependence, our oneness, and our vow to not harm, we may also recognize that the teachings are not one dimensional. They require of us a compassion and open heart. We may seek that kind of oneness, but in fact, we may need to take action, strong action, that is clear and loving in an unusual and different way. It's not enough to say we're all one, as Shikibu tells us. We also need to listen to the crickets, listen to the sound of the cries of the worlds, and take action. While I may have been wrapped up in my protection, what about the next person in that grocery store who was not protected and at risk? It's gone me to give an educational comment to these people. And not in a way that would turn them away, but in a way where they could listen. That's the very helpful image of the energy of Avalokiteshvara, who has all these tools in her hands, you know. We always see it visually as hammers and, and knives and saws and rakes. But it's also the skillful word. It's the ability to change 
to turn away from our own ego and our own opinion about something in order to make a skillful intervention. What kinds of skillful interventions can we make now, wherever we are? You know, in my building here, uh, there's a whole team of volunteers that have put themselves together and uh, they're willing to shop for people who shouldn't go out and uh, to help various elderly and housebound folks and to interact online with people who are lonely and, and need help. So I wonder what you are all doing and I hope that you can find some way to express Avalokiteshvara's energy some small way that you can do that. You know, on our IO list, on just in our email list, there are those that, that offer encouraging words or offer a, a funny uh, a, a video or a thoughtful idea. That's a beautiful way to interact and to, and to support the community and the people who are writing letters to the prisoners, the prisoners are in very, very frightening state. And that letter writing is so calming for the prisoners to write back and for our group to, to connect them to. Maybe it's just a generous tip you offer. I mean, how courageous these people on these bicycles that are taking items to different people. Maybe it's just an encouragement. When we accept Avalokiteshvara's energy in ourselves, we ourselves are healed, are encouraged, and our own fears and anxieties lessen. And then, of course, there's Manjushri. Uh, the wonderful energy of cutting away our delusions, getting rid of our bullshit. Manjushri is always standing next to us with a sword in her hand, ready to cut away our delusions, our ideas that prevent us from seeing what is really the most compassionate course of action in the moment. We can trust our internal manjusri to help us make the, the right ethical decisions, to take the right actions in the moment. Right now, we're all called to pay attention to our own tendencies for fear and anger. Let manjusri help us cut away that fear bring us back to this moment and away from this, the anxiety that, that naturally arises at such a time. Manjushri will help us maintain that first precept of not harming. Non-harming is not just refraining from action, it is acting also. It is acting to reduce harm to offer care, to offer support to others. Please accept the deep and powerful teachings of these precepts. They give us strength. But we have to open our hearts to them. To open our hearts to everyone. And then we can be strong. One of my, my favorite stories is folklore from China. Uh, talks about a dedicated, aspiring person determined to grasp these teachings of the compassionate Avalokiteshvara. So concentrated and focused on just getting this compassion. This person sat there 
in deep meditation. And as so it so happened, Avalokiteshvara was taking a walk at that time and walked by and saw this person, this practitioner, so earnest and grasping for enlightenment, for compassion, to find the compassion in his life. So she was delighted to see this. He tapped on the shoulder. The seeker of compassion turned and shouted, get away from me. Can't you see I'm meditating to find Avalokiteshvara? The Bodhisattva just smiled and walked on. It's so easy to miss. I love the story because I see myself in it so often, so caught up on being compassion, I miss the compassion. The first precept is not harming. That not harming is offering kindness and refraining from ill will. How can we do that? How do we do that? Can we open our hearts even more and care for ourselves, those around us who are so frightened and anxious that they may not appear to be anxious at all. And they may be disregarding what we think are important things to pay attention to. How can we care for these people? How can we open our hearts and see that behind it is this anxiety, this fear? Let's not be like this practitioner who's looking for the idea of compassion and missing the moment of connecting to the person who's in front of you. I wrote a verse to, to end this talk. The virus is all around us and so are people, sick and not sick. How can we serve them? How to atone for everyone's karma? Cover your face and bless those who pass by.